All right, and we are live. Thank you so much for, jo for joining us. Um, hi everyone, my name is Beth Gilligan. I am with the Coolidge Corner Theater in Brookline, Massachusetts. I know um, there may be audiences from other art houses across the country who are joining. So uh, thank you for being here on this um, beautiful, at least in Boston, uh, Saturday afternoon. Um, Epicentro is an amazing film. I hope you've all had the chance to see it. It's currently playing in the Coolidge virtual screening room. And I know it's also playing virtually at other art houses again across the country. And by purchasing these films and watching these films, you are supporting your local art house theater. So thank you for that. And you're also supporting great works of art like this. Um, this film was described in the Boston Globe as a hypnotic immersion into a country and culture embargoed by decades of our country's foreign policy. It premiered in Sundance in person, I'm presuming, in, in January 2020, where it won the Grand Jury Prize for World Cinema Docu Documentary Competition. And um, we are thrilled to have the filmmaker here. And I meant to ask you beforehand if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but we can, we can work that out live. Hubert Sauper? Up here? Am I getting that even? Where, where you prefer? It depends where you are. In, uh, okay. In France, of course, uh, so far. <laughs> so far. Okay. Excellent. Um, well, we're thrilled to have you here. Um, and if anyone has questions, feel free to drop them into the chat. I saw there are some questions in the chat already. Um, and but we can we can get started. First of all, congratulations. I know you're in Poland right now, where where you're having an actual physical premiere of your film. Um, how's it been to, to roll out a film during the pandemic? Is it because uh, you have two other wonderful documentaries, Darwin's Nightmare and We Come as Friends that you uh, premiered during more tranquil times, I guess. Uh, has, has this been an odd experience? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm glad to talk to you, Beth. Thank you mm -hmm. for having me. Um, uh, I, I love Boston. I've been there a few times and at Harvard to give classes and uh, and I, I look forward to come back physically. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, as we speak in this very hour, um, the Polish premiere of Epicentro happens. So that's why like in 30 minutes sharp from now, I have to jump up and, and run to greet the audience. Mm -hmm. the, the cinema is uh, inside of a Stalinian cathedral, which I, I just took a, a selfie. Maybe you see that. That's what it looks like. Oh, you can't really see it, huh? Kind of. Oh, yeah, now I see it. Oh, it's very cool. Like, it's yeah. like, a few, like half an hour ago, it looks like the Empire State Building, but it was made by the Soviet imperialists. Mm -hmm. um, same aesthetic, same ideas, um, Greek columns. Inside this cinema runs Epicenter, which is a somewhat anti-imperialistic movie, but I, I, I prefer to be referred to as an analyst of, of, of a collective soul or a collective psychology. Um, in this case, Epicentro, as you maybe know, or, is, is shot in, in Havana, Cuba, mm -hmm. which is the epicenter of the American empire. And yeah. uh, part of the story of the film, but I, I, I don't know, Beth, if I should explain the film or if, we, if I should ask, ask you to ask questions or what what, well, uh, what should we do? Uh, we can start, well, why don't you tell us how you came, because your previous films, you've been in um, Tanzania and South Sudan. What was it about Cuba and what, what drew you to Cuba and, and landed you there ultimately? Um, it's, it's kind of a strange thing. Uh, as a European, I've been traveling over the last 25 years um, outside of Europe to understand a bit, a little bit, who we are and what the hell we are doing. Very painful experience sometimes. What, what, what we Europeans have been doing over centuries on the planet. The part of our history is Europeans becoming Americans, uh, killing indigenous people. You know, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's another painful story. But um, when, when the U.S became independent from from the European powers. Uh, not very long later, it became uh, a colonial power on its on itself, uh, in itself. And it's, it's, it's in the US. It's kind of strange to um, that the European talks about this, but uh, it, it is the biggest empire ever 
the planet has ever seen uh, and it's it still doesn't like to call itself as an empire very much is that true you, well, you, yeah, that is accurate. <laughs> and, of course, and of course it comes from this schizophrenia situation of being uh, at the same time anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist by by celebrating independence day and and at the same time uh, throwing uh, a, a part of the planet into dependence uh, the, the 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 first step of um uh the, the first uh, american flag overseas uh was in guantanamo and uh, de facto the spanish american war that you know americans know about and there are people know about the famous line uh, Rem remember the main <clears throat> the famous uh battleship that blew up in, in the port of havana that moment 1898 was founding uh explosion the big bang uh that uh, that kicked in the, the us as a, as a world empire um, and of course, it was anticipated uh, before. It was anticipated by people like and around Teddy Roosevelt, who is known kind of as a hero, I think, in the US. Um, I don't think he's much of a hero for, for me after having researched, because one of the parts, uh, stop me if I, if I go too far, but uh, one of the, the interesting things about Teddy Roosevelt was that he was uh, the first movie star ever. Mm -hmm. um, he was the, f the person who invented the selfie uh, in, in, in some way. He, he was a very, very wealthy person who knew how to uh, create a, a legend and a myth around his persona in order to later be voted for president, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, was, he had become president because he had made out of himself a, a hero that liberated Cuba from the Spanish that uh, dressed up as a cowboy with the Rough Riders, uh, like stealing the whole narrative of Buffalo Bill, essentially, mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, is, is a reenactment of the heroic white man liberating the, the West, who, who, as you know. So the whole narrative of uh, manifest destiny, going to the West, uh, searching the last late, the new frontier, um, was kind of over when California had been taken. Uh, but then it, the, the, the idea went on to the Pacific and the Caribbean. And that's how America became an empire. So the explosion of the Maine is a part of the story of, M of Epicentro. But uh, Epicentro, my documentary is told by 10, 10, 11 year old uh, children in Old Havana who live exactly at the place where the main exploded 120 years ago and who help us understand world history and strange as it sounds in a new way. Yeah, then well, there is a, one of yeah. the striking things about it because there's that line, remember the main, but I think honestly, if you were to talk to most Americans about the Spanish American war, there, there isn't that sense. And I think one of the striking things is um, the, the people in your film, and also I was in Cuba about a decade ago, I, I, I noticed the same thing. There was, just, there was just such a strong sense of history and historical knowledge. And these children who you, I think you refer to as the little prophets in, in, in the credits have, have this really strong sense of place and history and context that I think is absent from many of the sort of colonial powers or former colonial powers. Did you find that to be the case as you were talking to them? And did, were you surprised by that? Well, I, I call them young prophets. Oh, young prophets, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't uh, surprised uh, in the sense that, of course, I knew when I was going to make a film in, in Cuba, it's one of the places on the planet which is, which is much more politicized than other places. And uh, one of the reasons is, of course, that there is no, there's no video games and no Facebook uh, and no other distraction from political thinking and no Jesus Christ, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, for the last year, you know, it was, I mean, Cuba was a, was a, was a Catholic epicenter, epicenter for four, 450 years until Castro and, uh, and Che Guevara said, let's uh, just skip that. Mm -hmm. and they made kind of made out of themselves, uh, you know, replacements of, uh, of, of, you know, saints and heroes. <laughs> it's another yeah. story. But, uh, but um, so I knew, I knew in Havana, I, would, I was going to find, this politicized politicization is that the word, mm -hmm. um, and I've I found these really amazing amazing characters, uh, Leonelli and Ainelis, 
who not only speak for all children on this planet, but who are also speak for for women on, in, in this world for uh, disobedience uh, against uh, patriarchy and, and empire. So it, it is just such a it was such a treat to to spend time with them and uh, a chunk of my life and I spent three years in Havana and um, and what came out is a, is, a, is in a way uh, I wouldn't call it a lesson of, of geopolitics but it's like an experience to experience history suddenly in such a new way and in such an amazing way through the help of this magical thing called cinema and cinema is is itself a part of the theme of, of Epicentro because at the very, very same time when the main exploded 1898, that was the very moment when cinema became relevant as a means to communicate to masses uh, and to be used as propaganda. So the first films that the US Americans saw in history were de facto propaganda films made to villainize Spain and to rally for the war against Spain and to, to uh, you know, to rally the, 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 the lines, uh, uh, remember the main uh, Cuba Libre and all these things, you know, which was, uh, to be fair, uh, an important thing because, uh, because Spain was really a dominating kind of fascist uh, uh, entity, you know, and, uh, and the, the Spaniards treated uh, the villagers in Cuba literally like, like trash. While as Havana was already a very you know, bright and uh, cosmopolitan city with casinos and theaters and opera houses and and um, Havana was on the way already to become what Vegas is today, you know, mm. uh, just in the Caribbean version, you know, and it would be much more of, of that if, if the Cuban revolution wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Um, so, so, so cinema, the birth of cinema is a part of the story of Epicentro. But it's kind of, you know, I, I, I spent three years of my life to kind of formulate uh, thoughts and, uh, and, uh, and connections. And it's, of course, a, a crazy reduction of me sitting in a hotel room in Poland and trying to narrow it that. Well, so. well, how do you go about that process? Because you were there for three years. And I think I, that, I think that really comes through in the relationships, because there's that scene where it's such a stark contrast, where there's that terrible photographer who's in somebody's house taking the pictures, and you just feel like, oh, but you, the, the relationships you have with the children and with the other people who appear in the film, they appear to be deep and genuine. And how, I, I guess, how do you even begin to approach putting together a film? How, how does, can you talk a little bit about the evolution of the filmmaking process? Like, how do you begin this approach? No, it's, it's of course, it's a very complicated process, but uh, unlike you might think, uh, because I, I film really what, what is called cinema verite, so to say, mm -hmm. but, but that said is that my films, both Darwin's Nightmare and We Come As Friends and Epicenter are very, very conceptual films. Um, so I, I do a lot of writing, I do a lot of researching. Uh, I, I really do uh, my homework uh, years on end mm -hmm. to kind of come to a point where I say, okay, now I have a, an, uh, an idea what the film could look like. Now I just need to find the right place and the right energy and the right humans to to kind of uh, tell the story and of course uh, the two main characters of epicentro are such amazing young girls in in old havana and of course i didn't just um, go into any classroom and by chance you know any child in Havana would talk about geopolitics of course it was it was the form of uh, um it was a long search for these characters. Um, but also, I didn't really find these people to be in my film. They almost found me to, to, to appear. That's, yeah. that's really strange to say. It was like, it's like, it, it, it is as mysterious and as hard to explain as like, how did you meet your, the love of your life? You know, it's uh, how, why? Because so many hundreds of things coincided and then, and then you met. 
or maybe not yet. <laughs> it's like just an example. <laughs> Her husband's in the other room, so <laughs> you'd probably be pretty sad if I said that. No. Yeah, you can. Um, but I saw uh, some things like people ask me a lot, "How did you find these kids?" And uh, the truth is, like, one of the kids who is the, the central character, Leonelli, uh, imposed herself to the film in a scene that I shot without knowing her. It was in the, in the middle of the night, a crowd of like 10, 15 uh, kids screaming, Viva Fidel, Hasta la Muerte, Revolution, until, to, until death. And I was just, and it just went on and on and just kept running with my, I think my iPhone lighting their faces somehow and I just kept rolling. It was essentially research material. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then suddenly this one girl uh, just started drumming on, on the bigger boy's chest and says, shut up, I'm talking. And she just <laughs> made her way to the front and one of the bigger boys, she's, she's an idiot, she's an ignorant, pulled her back and she came back again and she says, I'm talking. And she starts to talk in front of my camera <laughs> and talk about the revolution and all this, you know, Cuban propaganda essentially. Uh, but that said, he said she was, of course, re 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 like, we heard re, 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 reiterating at a Cuban propaganda, but you can also feel that she's super brilliant and super mm -hmm. present and super intelligent. So, so, and suddenly I saw that footage uh, and I was like, I need to find that kid. Uh, yeah. And did you all know the, the, the kid? kid? And from her and her parents and stuff. And then we were, we were in the game, you know, we were oh, friends. Yeah, did so you always know we'd be told through the eyes of children that the sort of the protagonist, I guess, if you want to call them that, um, would be children in this film? Did you know it would? Did you have that sort of set in mind beforehand? I, I, did, I did, but I, I didn't know in the beginning that it would take such a such a magnitude. I thought yeah. children would be a part, uh, which they are in all my films, by the way. It's, it's if I want or not. Uh, it's just uh, it's just fascinating humans at the, the age of, around for me it's always most interesting around 10 11 12 the pre adolescent age when the kind of the political awakening starts and positioning in the world and the interest uh, interest in the in the grown ups world but they're still children so it's really that's a really interesting age for me and um what happens in in this kind of work is is I all I do as a, as a filmmaker is is kind of starting the debate to a certain direction and then let things happen and essentially send out energy and send them my attention like a parent that's like you're talking I'm listening to you I take you serious uh, you're smart you're beautiful just I listen to you but it also works, of course, only when you create a, a, a relationship of 100% of trust and, uh, and when you create a relationship uh, that the characters also are um, kind of interested in communicating to the filmmaker in this, in this sense and also interested in, in that weird guy who I am in Old Havana with my face that I have and of course not a typical Habanero. <laughs> um, so it, it's this dialectic of uh, this, this like play of um, of um, um, fascination, I, I would say. And I'm filming literally my fascination mm -hmm. uh, of how these people, not only children, of course, but how these people move and think and what drives them and what uh, gets them angry or fearful. So. So I'm just translating that into cinema. That's all yeah. I do. And I hold my very tiny camera and, and run. Yeah, that's wonderful. I, and I think the tiny camera must give you such, I, I don't know how long you've, you've been filmmaking, but just having um, the equipment to be able to be on the street and be more, you know, not be encumbered by, you know, heavier cameras. And, and did you work with a crew or was it really, was this more just you? No, I mean, I have a very, I have a big crew in a sense uh, because I have, you know, really a lot of people around me who help me find stuff, read stuff, go research, um, uh, figure out stuff. But, but in the moment of, of, of truth, when I shoot, usually I'm, I'm alone. Yeah. 
and like yeah. sound and image and everything, which gives the whole movies, all, all of my movies kind of a, a rough touch. Um, but that's what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a style now. And so if I, I mean, despite myself, it became a style. <laughs> yeah. It's not like, uh, and I, 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 I have the choice, of course, that uh, either making sure that every face is super lit up and every every shot is on the on the spot uh, in focus, or uh, the shot has this super energy and is maybe for for moments out of focus or in the dark and 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 comes back and it's just so much more powerful for me. Th that is essentially uh, what cinema is at, where cinema is at its best, you know. Yeah. When when you can we can when you can as a spectator dive in and, and have this experience and go on this crazy ride and 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 also when you feel like you're taken serious as a, as an as somebody who can think because the uh, cinema uh, versus tv documentary aesthetic uh just to give you one thought i think the the uh, the uh, kind of a crime against 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 people's intelligence is filming uh, a, a police car coming and then the voice is saying that now the police is coming you know in a, in a yeah. classical documentary and and what what i think is like are you, you you take me first you think i'm stupid i can i can see the police coming why did why did, why does the voice tell me what i'm seeing why does the voice tell me how i should see it so that is essentially creating a, a intellectual anesthesia mm -hmm. And that's in big parts what TV is, mm -hmm. and, and some uh, and some uh, you know filmmakers unfortunately uh, get this have this disease in 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 cinema documentaries too you know mm -hmm. to kind of explain I mean that's how how parents make idiots out of their three year old kids when you say this is a this is a bottle this is a bottle. You know? <laughs> So what, how, is, how is the kid going to be growing up? You know, if, if it's if it's taken as an idiot from from the beginning. So that's what TV does to 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 millions of people, and it's it's it's, it's somehow criminal. I'm I'm a bit extreme in exp expressing it, but my plaidoyer is that cinema challenges your spirit. Cinema doesn't always explain, uh, you know, what you should think or how you should see things. But because you're challenged, you find stuff, and because your own life experience feeds into this experience called life cinema film, and then that becomes this cocktail that is so magical. Yeah. And then you feel like I, I, I've just gone on, on this on this amazing journey to Havana, and I just met these amazing people after two hours. It's uh, after two hours of being in a film. Of course, better in in a physical theater. I know it, it, but I still even seeing it on you know a, a smaller screen. I, I I did feel that sense. One of my favorite scenes though was watching the kids. I think when they're watching um, the early sort of French films like Voyage to the Moon, and there's this one girl, and just the look on her face, she's just so you know, captured by it. And you can tell she just, there, there's that sense of everything you were just describing, that sense of awe, that sense of transport. And it just, it was, it was lovely to see. It was a very kind of poignant reminder of what we're missing back here in the- That's exactly what you're just saying is, is that is cinema enhanced. It's, it's because cinema essentially is not only seeing a film, but seeing a film uh, with the group and, uh, and the, having the energy of the group. But when you see somebody in a film, watching a film, you're also with this person. So you're also watching with this kid. Yeah. It's all footage, you know? So, so it's, it's, it, makes a, it makes a link. Yeah. And it's hard. I mean, it's also, you know, with, if you're watching things at home, you have a million distract uh, kids who are coming, you know, up and asking for a snack and it's, you, you can't immerse to the same degree, but it was, I think, um, back to your film, I guess, um, I know we have a few questions that I want to get to. Um, speaking of the subjects, somebody sort of asked, um, if, uh, oh, somebody's asking when the Coolidge Corner Theater will offer Epicentro for virtual viewing. And I can, Answer that question. It's it's available now. Coolidge.org. Rent it today. Um, and in our at your local art house. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Uh, oh sure. Can anyone in the U.S. click and see the film on your platform or just? Yeah, they can, they can see it through the Coolidge um, if they have a other art house they're loyal to. But yeah, Coolidge.org. Um, but, but someone in Europe cannot. 
Only in America. I, I don't know if there's geo blocking or not, but anywhere anyone in America can watch this film via cool. When people look for because people keep asking me where can I see your film and I get it drives me crazy. I say it's it's out. It's out. So I, yeah, it's a lot of virtual because most um, many art houses are are still closed, unfortunately. Um, somebody was asking in the Q&A if you would um, been in touch with people, um, if you know, have the, um, the subjects of your film, have there been any screenings in Cuba, um, you know, what's, yes, what's yes, going the on? Yes, the answer is yes. Of course, when, I, when Sundance was, of course, the world premiere and I, I went to uh, left Sundance uh, uh, with, with this great honor of winning the, the grand jury prize and then I went straight to Havana and I I had, uh, you know, uh, in mind to show this movie to the kids uh, who are in the film and the people who are in the film. But also I needed to kind of, I shouldn't, uh, I needed to kind of uh, announce it at the government, you know, because, mm -hmm. because Cuba is, you know, you cannot just say I'm, I'm, I decided to show a film now. So, so high government officials came, the kids came, the famous, uh, a Cuban uh, Walt Disney uh, Juan Padron, who is in the film, came, <clears throat> and it was the children were in the first row on the floor, and they were just screaming. us and at some points you couldn't hear the film anymore. Just they were so happy, and I was there too, and I was so happy. We were just all rolling on the floor essentially, and and then the, the film was over big silence, the kids went out front, like were applauded like Nina Simone. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was like, I had this moment of, of, of uh, solitude because I, I knew there were some, you know, old Stalinists in the first rows and uh, they could have just said, you know, what, what the hell are you doing? Estran Hero, you know? Um, and then this one woman got up and gave a plaidoyer, uh, like a monologue that this uh, epicenter is, is a love letter to to Cuba and to its children and to its, uh, you know, lucha, how do you say? Uh, la lucha, how do you say? And in, in its battle, its, its fight for freedom. And this woman was uh, Mariela Castro, Castro's daughter, and which I I didn't know about before. And then, of course, because Mariela Castro said the film is, is a it's a piece of art and it's genius. Everyone agreed. Applause yeah. <laughs> <laughs> followed. Yeah. Now that was in a safe ground, and because it's it's not always flattering for the revolution. Yeah. It's not it's not a propaganda movie for for the for the Castro um, government, but it's also not hostile because I think whatever one thinks, uh, the the revolution was uh, was necessary and. Uh, what everyone kind of agrees now is that it's not the best idea that uh, that revolutionaries um, try to do economics uh, 60 years down the road but that's another story yeah. so but that said is that the embargo that the us is exercising onto cuba is really really a crime you know and uh, there is nothing to say uh, about it and there's um, every year i think the un Security Council meet and every year, like every country except the US are opposing the embargo. So the US are running the embargo and every, literally every country on the, on the planet say this is, this shouldn't be. But yeah. the embargo doesn't go away because, uh, you know, there's people in the White House who I don't want to spell their names either, who just want to finish off. Um, yeah. That is the, there is there is a, a French word uh, that's called pompier pyromane, pompier pyromane, which is a fire a fireman and a pyromane is like someone who blows up stuff or, or lights stuff. So there are some pompier pyromane in in the White House. So, but right. that's, that that is the that is the legacy of, of the American interventionism, which is the theme of Epicentro. Yeah, and you capture it really at a transitional moment with, Kat. well, actually, I know you need to go in a few minutes, so this will be the last question. You capture um, 
kind of a transitional moment in the sense that, you know, Fidel Castro passed away during the course of your filming. Did you feel a shift or was was the shift, um, kind of, I guess he, he, you know, he had been ill for many years. Did it feel any, you know, different once he, he passed or did you sense things opening up more or any changes? Um, well, when, you know, when Castro died, everyone on the world in, and in Cuba thought like, this is going to be a big game changer. This is, everything's going to change. Uh, and it didn't, that's, that's very strange. Mm-hmm. And me as a filmmaker, I was there actually when, when it happened to, in November 2016. Mm-hmm. And of course I was expecting that now you know, things are going to shift and big things are going to happen. And it would, would be, would have been of course a part of my movie but it didn't so which was good in the end for for my film because i i, I went much deeper into the, like the the like the principal questions what is imperialism what is interventionism and what is the narrative around it because what we europeans and 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 americans i always say we because i'm uh, i kind of grew up in america too with americans when i was a kid uh, a lot my my parents ran a little in and in the Alps, and we had like hundreds of, uh, of uh, or thousands of, of uh, U.S. Americans from the uh, U.S. Air Force actually who came as guests to the inn of my parents. So I grew up with these people. Um, they were U.S. Air Force because the Vietnam War was going on, and they had to recover from bombing the shit out of Vietnam. That's an, that's a whole different film actually. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> So they were based in, uh, you know, between America and Vietnam, which was uh, Frankfurt Rhine Main Air Base. So that said, it's just because I say often we, so I always include we Europeans and we Americans. Mm-hmm. So what we do best is not only overthrow uh, cultures, people, take 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 their religions, take their honor, take their land. But we also are, are masters in, in inventing a narrative that makes us always look good afterwards. So, and and the U.S. is is a super master in it with uh, super tools like cinema since 1898. Mm-hmm. And uh, because 1898, the Spanish-American War uh, was kind of hard to kick in, hard to communicate that it's necessary. Mm-hmm. Uh, cinema was an instrument to 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 heat up for the war, so there were like uh, short propaganda films made by Edison's camera people, like these one minute uh, black and white films of uh, an execution of the evil Spaniards against the poor Cubans, and it was all uh, in staged. It was all staged somewhere in Florida or in, or in uh, Louisiana, I don't know, and. Uh, but it became like the historical document how evil the Spaniards are, and that's why we have to intervene, and that's why we have to save Cuba, Cuba Libre, etc. But of course, the, the idea behind was to take Cuba, plant a flag in Guantanamo, dig a canal through Panama, and own you know the Caribbean and the Pacific and the planet ultimately. So it's always the same. It's, I mean, I guess the Romans did the same, you know, too. Mm-hmm. or maybe not. I mean, I, I, I often wonder how the old empires operated maybe they just said like let's just screw the germanics and and that's it that's like fuck them <laughs> i shouldn't say that but maybe that was their narrative or or i wonder if the greeks or the romans already had this mechanism of kind of self-convincing uh you know narrative that uh, that it had to be for the better for everybody i don't know i i i have to study that it's interesting. Well, like on that know. uplifting note, I'm sorry. I know you have you have. Thank you so much for spending. Because I know um, for those who missed the beginning, um, Hubert is going to his actual live Polish premiere Q and A uh, this evening. So we were very yeah, happy like, to have some happy. time. Um, so we will let you go. Um, be there in person. This is Warsaw by night. Yeah. So grateful for your wonderful film. Um, and. Thank you for for taking the time. Um, Everyone, please stream Epicentro. And then when we're back up and running, I feel like we're gonna have to do a screening series of all the films you missed when you were in quarantine on the big screen. Um, It's kind of, of, when people see me talking like this half crazed out European, uh, they they don't realize it's a very uplifting movie actually.
It is a beautiful, that's true. No, it is. There's a lot we can go into like, the Una Chaplin and the, the, yeah, how film weaves its way in and the, the beauty of, of, of Havana Una, and the people. Una Chaplin is just, just such a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant figure. And she's in the film, she has a major role in it. Yeah. So I, uh, yeah, she's. Well, uh, that's great at the end too. Yeah, no, Charlie Chaplin. I showed Char. I've been showing my kids who are four and seven Charlie Chaplin films during quarantine, and they love it. It's true. It's just something about him and his. Yeah, films it's just, just they it's just, start him early, everyone. Um, it's but yeah, but thank you again. Sorry, we can. There, there are more conversations to be had. Hopefully, sometime you'll come to Boston. Um, we have a beautiful Art Deco theater. Uh, we'd love to have you there. Sometime. I will. I will. I'll probably come back to to Harvard and give some classes there. Please do. Yeah. Well, thank you again, and good luck with.